big changes are in the air. Here at the National Air and Space Museum, we are going through some big changes. And in order to accomplish these changes, we've got to move some really big things. Like airplanes and spacecraft. Today, we're going to take you behind the scenes. We're going to take a look at how we accomplish these complex tasks by using simple machines. We're going to look at all of the simple machines and see them in action. But more importantly, we're going to see that simple machines don't change the amount of work done. Nope, they just make work easier by doing one of three things. They increase the amount of force applied. They increase the distance on which that force is applied. Or they change the direction the force is applied. Any way you look at it, simple machines make work easier. This, this is STEM in 30. 30. Come on, let's get to work. Marty, why are we out walking around in the middle of the woods? Trust me, Beth, this is the best place to learn about simple machines. Ta-da! This is a mill. This is an old mill. It has not been to space. It does not fly. It has nothing to do with air and space. Maybe some simple machines. Beth, where there's a mill, there's a way. I knew you were going to say that. We're going to learn all about simple machines, even the ones we use at the National Air and Space Museum, but we're going to start by looking at a mill. Let me introduce you to a friend of mine, Catherine. Beth, Hi. this is Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi. So we're here at... Welcome to Colvin Run Mill. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the mill? So we are a 19th century grist mill, and we still grind grain today the way they would have 200 years ago, using water power and lots of simple machines. Colvin Run Mill in Great Falls, Virginia was built circa 1811. It is one of the few surviving operational 19th century water-powered grist mills in the Washington, D.C. area. Its restored mechanism is a nationally significant example of automated technologies pioneered in milling and later adopted across American industry. Down the gravel path of the park is the Miller's House, home to some of the families who owned and operated the mill. In 1883, Addison Millard moved his family here when he bought the old mill. Addison, his wife Emma, and some of their 20 children lived in that house. When Addison died, the family stayed and operated the mill until 1934. The mill was acquired by Fairfax County Park Authority, which runs it today. Open to the public, the mill runs a variety of programs for schools, scouts, and the community. I've got some friends here to help us out today. Nice. Come, Come on, on in, guys. Morning, guys. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Well, we're getting ready to go into the mill, and we're going to be looking for simple machines. But let's take a quiz first. How many simple machines are there? Six. Six. Good job. Before we head inside, just know that it's really loud in there. We're going to watch the mill for a little bit, and then we'll turn it off, and we'll have a little conversation. Cool? Yeah. Y'all ready to go in? Yeah. Let's go. Shut her down! What simple machine did you notice really working in here? Wheel and axle. Wheel and axle, that's right. Exactly right. Catherine, what's going on in here? So this is kind of the engine for the entire factory. All of the power is being generated here by this wheel and axle. That's called the greater face gear. Gears are all wheels and axles. And when we engage them, when the teeth are fitting together just like a zipper, then they move one another and then we move the power to all the machines down the building and upstairs on the top three floors. Wow. And this big wheel's going around how fast? So the big wheel that you're looking at right now is going around 10 times a minute. And the grindstones that we're using to create the flour is going around about 100 times a minute. Wow. Why does that happen? Well, the gears outside have to spin fast enough to power all of the other gears here in the building. So when that's going fast enough, it makes the smaller gears go even faster. 
Everything in here is basically a machine, and all of those gears are what are powering the other machines. And why does it have to go so fast? It has to go so fast because we're taking the power a long distance, so we get it going fast enough so that when it's on the other side of the building or upstairs on the third floor, we still have enough of that power to move all of the other machinery. This reminds me a lot of a couple of other factories that we've seen. Right, like the Wright Cycle Shop at the Henry Ford in Dearborn, Michigan, and a very early Boeing plant that we saw at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. Colvin Run Mill is a 200-year-old mill used to grind grain and corn. Even though they were used for different purposes, you can see similarities between the mill and the Wright Brothers Bike Shop and the first Boeing airplane factory. The Wright Brothers had a series of interconnected machines. Their shop had a different power source than the mill. Their lathe, drill press, grinder, and wind tunnel were powered off of a natural gas engine. The main problem with their shop was that it wasn't big enough to assemble the first airplane. In Seattle, Washington, Boeing built their first airplane production facility. They had over 20 buildings, one of which is now part of the Museum of Flight. Here they built components of airplanes using a series of simple and complex machines. We're in a 200-year-old mill today, but the simple machines that they used back then, we still use today. Let's go to the National Air and Space Museum and take a look at how we use the wheel and axle there. Let's roll! Hi, I'm Stephanie Stewart. And I'm Kristen Horning. And we are museum specialists at the National Air and Space Museum. Many of the artifacts at the National Air and Space Museum use a wheel and axle. One thing you may not expect to see is a truck. It doesn't fly or go into space, but this vehicle and its use of the wheel and axle is vital to the work we do at the National Air and Space Museum. Behind us here we have our truck that we use to haul equipment. We haul artifacts um, between all of our museum locations so they can come out to the shop, get restored, and then put back on display for the public. So we have um, four different trailers that we switch between depending upon the load. So we'll have a low boy um, for some of our equipment, our heavier equipment, and then if we are moving wings or fuselage, we'll be using this flatbed. We have an enclosed trailer that we use for more delicate artifacts. Most of the time we're just doing round trips from downtown at the National Mall building site and then coming out here to Udvarhazi or out to our uh, third facility out in Suitland, Maryland where we keep artifacts that are not on display. We have to move the artifacts from downtown to Hazi because they are renovating the building and we can't have those renovations take place while the aircraft are either suspended inside the building or just on the ground in the building because there is so much construction work going on around it, it would be unsafe for the artifact. And we are also having the restoration and the conservation done here at the Udvar Hazi Center. So they are able to bring it into their shop where they have the tools they need to do their work. On any given move, we tend to have multiple teams of about four or five people that are involved at some point with disassembling if it's an aircraft, disassembling, preparing it to get ready to move, securing it to the trailer. So it's quite an extensive operation. It takes quite a bit amount of people to get an aircraft apart, uh, ready for transportation and moved to its location. You're starting to see more and more uh, female truck drivers out there, but it is pretty unusual, especially we have a staff of three right now who do have CDLs who, who drive the truck, and to have two uh, female drivers is, is pretty significant. You may notice um, we have stickers on the cab of our tractor, uh, similar to aircraft markings on their fuselage. And many years ago, what we started to do was to place the stickers as representations of different loads. Uh, you have the forklifts at the front um, representing the different equipment, so cranes, um, forklifts, and pa platform lifts. And then we have the aircraft, um, and then the shuttle to represent the different spacecraft. Um, and then down at the bottom, radial engines, because we've moved a lot of engines over time. And then right in the center at the very top is a little spaceman, and that's to represent the many, many spacesuits that were moved over the years. This amount of stickers doesn't fully represent everything we've moved. 
Uh, we stopped putting stickers on and since then have started moving a lot more objects related to the transformation revitalization project that have not made it onto our truck yet. Marty, it looks like you have a simple machine demo here for us. We do. So we've got a, a stick here, and then we have a, a cutout of another simple machine. And what simple machine do we have here? An inclined plane. That's right. This is an inclined plane. And so you guys are going to do a little demo here. We've got our tape man over on the end. You all are going to tape this inclined plane to the stick, and then we're going to wrap it around and see what happens. All right, let's tape that on the end there. Now, what do we have here? It's a screw. That's exactly right. An inclined plane wrapped around the stick gives us a screw. That's not the only screw we're gonna be looking at here. Catherine, can you tell us what is this screw and what does it do? So this is an example of an Archimedean screw. And here in our mill, we use the Archimedean screw to move our grain or our flour or our cornmeal from side to side in the building. And what happens is it's poured into one end and those paddles that you see are the inclined plane that are wrapped around that stick. And it, uh, the paddles stay in one place, but they move the grain down here to the other end. Unfortunately, we don't have any grain right now, but we do have some ping pong balls that we're gonna send through this. Nathaniel, why don't you uh, load her up and let's see what happens. All right, let's see it in action. So the screw's gonna turn, and if you put our ping pong balls in, don't get sucked into it. You can see how they move down here closer towards me. That is cool. You can see them, that screw at work moving the ping pong balls down the And down this the is how you move grain all the way across the mill? Move it all the way across the building. Wow. Now, I see some other simple machines here at the end. What's going on there? So once we've brought the grain all the way down here to the end, it dumps it into this bottom here and our pulley that has cups on the end will take that scoop of grain up to a different floor. So when we move things up and down, we're using the pulley, another simple machine, so that we don't have to carry it up and down three or four flights of stairs. We use both the inclined plane and the screw at the National Air and Space Museum, but sometimes in places you might not expect. Check it out. Hi, my name is Chris Redderson. I work in the Mary Baker Angen Restoration Hangar here at the Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center in Chantilly, Virginia. Today we're going to be looking at some aircraft, uh, DC-3, and our tool crib, demonstrating how we use simple machines like screws and inclined planes in our everyday work. Here we work on some of the larger artifacts in the collection. Right now, we're very busy because of a lot of the larger items from downtown having been moved out here while the museum is under construction. The tools we use to work on these aircraft all come back to simple machines. We use pulleys and wheels axles, and wedges. But one that we use a lot is the inclined plane. Even though some of these are small tools or look very simple, they make a big difference in what we are able to do when working on these priceless artifacts. Come on in. Looks like you're using another simple machine here. I am. So I'm using a wedge to shape this piece of wood. So the tool that I'm using is called a draw knife. And I shave the wood so I can make useful things like the legs on my shaving horse or pegs to hold this whole mill together. What do you got there, Beth? I, I actually have a little peg <laughs> that will hold the whole mill together. So this is a model of the joint. And so I can make a, a round peg out of a square piece of wood 
just by shaping the piece of wood. Wouldn't it be quicker to just go to the store and buy the peg? Well, 200 years ago, we couldn't just hop in our car and go to the store. We had to make them. This looks like it's more than one simple machine, though. It is. So our draw knife is two. We have handles, which are levers, and then the blade here, which is a wedge. And on my shaving horse here, this is the head, and the jaw is what's holding it in place so it's not moving when I'm shaving. You can see there's a fulcrum here, and this whole piece is another lever. So when I put my foot on the lever, it keeps the wood in place, and I can use my draw knife to shape the wood. Is that the only wedge here? It's not. We actually use wedges to cut our grain really finely when we're grinding. When you have a group of simple machines working together, what do you call that? I call that a complex machine. You guys want to try the complex machine here? <laughs> All right. <laughs> You all have done a great job using the wedge today, but do you know what my favorite kind of wedge is? A turkey sand wedge. Let's take a look at how we use wedges today. As you walk around the National Air and Space Museum, you get a chance to see many spectacular aircraft and spacecraft up close. However, one thing you may not notice are the simple machines that are in plain sight. The wedge is a simple machine and a variation of the inclined plane. It has two inclined planes set back to back. The wedge is very aerodynamic. Instead of cutting through a solid, it can cut through the air and lower the resistance made by the air itself. Here at the museum, once you know what you're looking for, you can see examples of wedges everywhere. From the shape of the front of airplanes and missiles to the leading edges of wings. The wings on a jet are wedges called airfoils. This shape allows the wings to cut through the air. The next time you visit an aviation museum or take a flight, be on the lookout for wedges hidden in plain sight. We've moved upstairs, and Claire, I have a little job for you. Can you help me out? We've got this bag of corn laying down here on the ground. I need you to pick that up for us. Go for it. Go ahead and set it down. That's, that's a little on the heavy side, isn't it? Did you struggle with that a little bit? All right, so should we make it a little bit easier? All right, well, we've got a simple machine that can help with that. Catherine, do you want to tell us what we're looking at here? So this is what we call a beam scale. And what we would use this for is to weigh the corn that the farmers are bringing to the miller. So we wouldn't dump an, a bag in here. They would actually bring a wagon load of corn or a wagon load of wheat from their farms and we would weigh it here because they would actually just sell it to the miller. So the merchant miller, this is his entire job, is taking that raw material and making a product. He doesn't have time to grow it. So the farmers bring it in put it in the scale, the miller can then weigh it, and what he needs is this counterweight. We put it on the beam here, this lever, and when it balances, when this fulcrum is straight up and down, this point where the lever moves, then I see where on the arm our counterweight is, and I can read how many hundreds of pounds of grain that the farmer has brought. And this scale here can weigh about 900 pounds of wheat. Well, let's see uh, how the lever works and how much easier or harder it is for Claire to lift this bag of corn. All right, why don't you all grab the bag of corn and let's put it in here. Bring it back over here. Good job. Now, Claire, let's send you over there and see if you can pick this up a little easier than when you were just trying to pick it up off the ground. Oh, wait a minute, hand. you're lifting that up with one, one hand. hand. <laughs> What's going on? 
lighter, it's much easier. Catherine, do you want to tell us why this is working this way? So a lever is a simple machine that's used to push, pull, or lift a load. So this lever is pulling that 50 pound bag of grain up and it makes your work easier. And it does that because you've covered more distance with less force. Catherine, this isn't the only lever in the mill. There's a lot of working levers. That's correct. You know, I used to have a dog that I wanted to name Lever. That's a dumb name. My brother decided we should name it Nate, because, you know, better Nate than Lever. Let's take a look at some modern day levers and how they're used. I am now joined by Brian Kerr, and we are in the United Airlines maintenance hangar. You do a lot of high-tech work in here, don't you? Oh, we do a lot of work in here. On a nightly basis, we prepare our airplanes for departures in the morning, taking our passengers to wherever their destination may be. And although it's high-tech work, you've got a lot of simple machines in here. I see, for instance, this pulley up here on the ceiling. What do you do for th with this? Well, absolutely. We use this crane mechanism that has a pulley attached to it. And what we do with that is we lift very heavy things. What about levers? Do you use levers? We in? use levers every single day. For example, we have this lever here, which is a torque wrench. Be very careful, it's very heavy. Oh, it is heavy. Yes. So what do you do with this? And we use this, this lever to torque very high torques on certain things. We have uh, certain nuts and certain uh, mechanisms on the airplane that we have to ensure that they're properly torqued. By torqued, I mean tightened so that they would not come off in flight. And one person couldn't do well, with a small... With <laughs> this one here, sometimes we need two guys on it, you know, actually putting pressure on the lever. We also have here, which is another lever, which is pretty much, this is a personal lever. Okay. <laughs> See, it does the same, same exact thing. thing. However, one person can use this. And I saw one other simple machine. Well, we have a sim another simple machine that we use every day in here. Wheels, pedals. And what we do, we use this for is to transport our technicians around and also to carry things so he doesn't have to, he does not, he or she does not have to carry He's them. He's got his wheels and his, there he goes, off on his bike. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking with us today, You're Brian. very welcome. <laughs> We've moved from the mill to the education center where we are looking at some more simple machines. Catherine, what are we looking at here? We have two sets of pulleys. We have a movable pulley and a stationary pulley. All right, so we've got a bag filled with some rocks down here. You look like you're a strong guy, so I want you to take our scale and pick that bag up and tell us what it, how much it weighs. Pick that up. All right, what do we got there? That's right about 10 pounds, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right, put it down. Okay, now take your scale off and you hook that bag up for me. I'll take your scale. I'm gonna hook the scale up here. And you're gonna give this a pull now, okay? So you give that a pull and let's look and see what the readout says. That's just about 10 pounds, isn't it? So the same amount of force. Now, Catherine, I thought pulleys were supposed to make our lives easier and that took the same amount of force to pick the bag up as it did using the pulley, what's going on? So all we're doing here with the fixed pulley is changing the direction of the force. If the pulley's staying in place and you're still pulling a 10 pound bag up. And the same distance. All right, but over there, it's not gonna take as much force, is it? Correct, we uh, have a longer distance. We're using four different pulleys. One of those is a movable pulley that's going with that load. But let's see what happens when we add more pulleys. Come around here, we'll take the scale. We're gonna do the same thing that we did over there. What I want you to do is hook that onto the bag. And then you're gonna lift that up. We've got about 10 pounds right there. Okay, put it down. Now, I'm gonna take the same scale. Claire, come on over. All right, you did it with one arm again and that is a lot less force to lift the same 10 pound bag. What's going on? So what we've done is we've distributed that force over a longer distance, which makes it easier to lift the same amount of weight. Right now, the National Air and Space Museum is going through a lot of renovations and there are a lot of ups and downs involved with that, including some using pulleys. Let's take a look at how we're using pulleys during renovation at the National Air and Space Museum. 
Large airplanes and spacecraft need to be moved during the museum's renovation as well as really heavy construction materials. Some of these objects weighing thousands of pounds. Many simple machines are used to accomplish this. Often, these simple machines are combined into complex machines to accomplish these enormous tasks. To raise and lower large objects, pulleys are used. A pulley itself is a wheel and axle that changes the direction of the force applied. With a pulley, pulling down makes something go up. An object called a load is on one end of the pulley, and when enough force is applied to the other end, the load rises. Pulleys can also be combined to create a mechanical advantage, allowing you to amplify the effectiveness of the force you applied. For a pulley, this means pulling a longer distance but using less force. A crane is a complex machine that uses mechanics to carry heavier loads than humans can. It combines many simple machines like the wheel and axle and levers. A crane uses a wheel and axle to move loads rotationally, but one of the most noticeable are the pulleys suspended from a projecting arm and used to move really heavy objects vertically as well. All of the artifacts come down and need to be moved out of the museum. Then they all have to go back in again when construction is finished. This is all possible because of the many hard workers and the simple machines they use every day. You all did a great job learning about simple machines today. We got a chance to see how they're used here at the mill and how we still use them today at the National Air and Space Museum. I have snacks. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> I have cornbread made with corn that was processed here at the mill. This looks delicious. Don't you start. We what? have some more work to do. What? That great big stone that m mills the corn, right? We've got to put that away. But that thing's enormous. Don't worry about it. There are simple machines that are going to help us out. Come on. All right. Thanks, guys. See ya. Enjoy your cornbread. Um. That, that's huge. Simple machines. Hey Marty, let's go, come on. I gotta close out the show, go. If you've enjoyed the show, we want you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And I've got a challenge for you. We want you to put your nose to the grindstone. Look for simple machines in your home, in your classroom, and send them along to us. We'd love to see them. Thanks for watching. <laughs>